Welcome to CN Live's continuing coverage of Julian Assange's extradition hearing at the Old Bailey in London. I'm Joe Loria, Editor-in-Chief of Consortium News. Day 14, a major development today. Uh, a few days back, the defense asked Judge Vanessa Baretza for four weeks for them to prepare their final arguments or final submissions. And she was taken aback by that and argued that the case had gone on for far too long. Of course, there was the interruption because of the pandemic from February, that there were numerous uh, witnesses, and there was another week of testimony to go. And, and at one point, she seemed to indicate that she would only give them the weekend to prepare after the final arguments and the final, sorry, the final submissions and witnesses and testimony are heard. Then she spoke about a week. She went away for a few days to think about that. And before today's uh, testimony began, she asked Edward Fitzgerald QC, the defense attorney, uh, to talk about this issue. And she startlingly raised the American election on November 4th. She said, uh, she asked Fitzgerald how a new administration or the election in general or a new administration would affect or impact the hearing. And she said, quote, uh, that's one of the factors going into my decision. He responded, it seems unlikely for you to make a judgment before November 4th, election day, and you would have to bear in mind that the future is uncertain. Much of what we say about Trump is because this proceeding was initiated by Trump. Some elements of the case would be worse if Trump were there, meaning reelected. She responded, I agree that one way or the other, my decision will come after an election in the United States. And for that reason, I find no reason, I've for that reason, I find no reason not to give you the four weeks. I think even the defense may have been uh, surprised by that. So she's been extremely lenient with them. She's going to give them four weeks to put together the final arguments uh, in this case. That starts at the end of next week. Today was the end of the third week. There'll be another week of testimony. At the end of the fourth week, we'll begin the four-week preparation by the defense also the prosecution gets those four weeks to marshal together their final argument and that date will be November 16. That's the date of the final arguments. She said she could not set a judgment day yet but that it would most likely seem to come after the new year. So she also said uh, that she considered Assange's condition in, in prison all this time uh, but that since the defense wanted the four weeks she's going to give them the full month to prepare those arguments. So after next week will be the last week of testimony and then November 16th rolls around. And then we have uh, the final arguments and sometime probably in January, you would imagine with the holidays uh, interrupting things that in, in the new year with uh, after the election, probably before the inauguration of a new president, which comes uh, Jan in January, uh, we will know whether she has decided to send Julian Assange to the United States or not. Uh, there was another moment where Fitzgerald argued that the defense should be able to put forward two new witnesses that were not on the list. And that was because Gordon Crumber, the assistant US attorney in Alexandria, Virginia, whose 36 page affidavit has really been the playbook for the prosecution, that he had stated many things in his um, in his affidavit, including saying point blank that there are no, uh, there is no solitary confinement at the Alexandria Detention Center where Assange would be held in pre-trial and during the trial. And also that, um, uh, I'm not sure what he said about Colorado, but the point Fitzgerald was making was that he wanted, he was unable to cross-examine Kromberg because Kromberg is refusing to make himself available. And this evidence is put every day into court by, by Lewis, uh, James Lewis QC, the prosecutor. He refers constantly to Kronberg's affidavit. And yet anything that is said from Kronberg's affidavit can't be challenged by the defense. Because of that, the defense wanted two new witnesses. One was a former chief psychiatrist of the US Bureau of Prisons. And another is a forensic psychiatrist who had spent many, many, uh, much time inside the ADX Florence, Colorado facility, where it seems to be agreed Assange would go 
if he's convicted and if he's extradited, of course, first. But he wanted F. Fitzgerald to bring these two witnesses on. At one point, he said that Kromberg and the prosecution should not have a divine right to have the last word. It was a, strongly, a very strong statement there, divine right. They don't have a divine right and that they should be ch challenged. And since they won't appear on the stand, he wanted, uh, Kromberg won't appear on the stand. He wanted these two witnesses to come and challenge the assertions made by Kromberg about conditions in U.S. prisons, particularly ADC and Alexandria and the Colorado facility. She denied that. She denied that, I guess, having already given four weeks to them. She felt she was lenient enough. I don't know her thinking, of course. But again, she's very much running a tight ship, this court, uh, Barretz is, and she was moving a case along, as many, many judges do. They, they, they like to move the case forward. They don't want to waste any time. And she has complained about a lot of wasting of time so far. And things have happened, like this the coronavirus scare uh, that shut down the court for a day and a half, for example. So she denied these two witnesses, which is a blow to the defense because Kromberg's words do hang out there and, and the, he, he does have the final word and they can't be challenged by these two new witnesses who know about the American facilities that Kromberg's talking about yeah, in, and a former US official, chief psychiatrist of the Bureau of Prisons who presumably would say that the conditions there are, ho are horrible and that there is a solitary confinement ADX. We don't know because we're not gonna hear their testimony, but that was an important moment. Now, Christian, Christian Raffinson, the editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks, uh, reacted to Beretz's decision to give the four weeks and particularly her citing the U.S. election as the reason for this. And his quote is, District Judge Vanessa Beretz has acknowledged what has been clear since even before the first indictment against Julian Assange was unsealed, that this is a politically motivated prosecution. So the fact that she was asking uh, Fitzgerald whether a new administration would change anything is, was quite significant today. She clearly understands the political dimensions of this case. Now, whether she thinks that rises to uh, annulling the extradition request by the United States because the treaty between the US and the UK clearly states uh, that no one can be extradited in a political case. And of course, the defense has been trying to argue from day one of this hearing that this is a blatantly political case. Politics certainly surround it. Even Beretza has acknowledged that today. We then moved on to a witness, Patrick Eller. Uh, Patrick Eller describes himself on his LinkedIn page as a digital forensic examiner, as an expert witness, as a principal consultant, an adjunct professor, a disabled veteran, and a retired special agent. He then said when he was sworn in, that he had been an MP, a military police. He was in the military and in law enforcement. He took the stand to talk about some highly complex technical issues surrounding a Jabba chat between someone named Nathaniel Frank and someone who was later identified at the Chelsea Manning court martial as Chelsea Manning. And in this chat, they're discussing whether they can crack a password. Now this issue is, uh, as I say, highly technically complex. I think uh, people who are less than completely computer literate might not have followed all of it or were able to piece together the argument. My view is Summers didn't do a tremendous job in uh, putting this in layman terms for the judge to understand, of course, and also for the public or the press reporting on this. So because of that, uh, I'm going to ask uh, our journalist, Kathy Vogan, who's also the executive producer of CN Live, and she's also been doing a hell of a job uh, live tweeting this case, to come in now and to explain and uh, report on what this charged testimony and cross-examination by Patrick Eller regarding the technical aspects of whether or not Assange tried to crack a computer and what exactly that meant. So now I'm gonna bring in Kathy Vogan and she will uh, present a report on that, Kathy. The best place to start is probably what Assange is actually accused of in the indictment. Assange agreed, first of all, this is, these are accusations, Assange agreed to assist Manning in cracking a password hash stored on the United States Department of Defense computers uh, connected to the secret internet protocol network, um, CIPRANET. 
uh, is the acronym, a United States government network uh, used for classified documents and communications. The next part is this enabled Manning to log on to computers under a username. These are the allegations that did not belong to her and that such measures would have made it more difficult for investigators to determine the source of the disclosures. So Ella was asked to look at the chat logs, right? Looking at the chat logs, uh, Lewis said, what did, you, what did you see there between Nathaniel Frank uh, and nobody? So these were the two users. Nobody is chatting uh, with Nathaniel Frank in the chat logs. That's allegedly Manning and Assange. Um, but uh, in fact, uh, this conversation, which doesn't have much context, in fact, it offers no context about what the password was for, what computer it was going to be used on, um, if at all, and also whether the computer that it was going to be used on uh, was in fact a government computer. Uh, according to Eller, there's nothing there in the chat logs that states that this was the intended purpose of this hash code. The other thing that comes out, and this is um, in re-examination, and I'm taking things out of context to try and paint a more coherent picture because um, this was gradually drawn out throughout the day, especially with a, a very, very long uh, showing off type of demonstration uh, by Mr. Lewis, the prosecutor, of what he knew about encryption. And that was all a waste of time as he found out. But this is a very important uh, point that was made. Um, so um, it seems to have been established that nobody was in fact, Chelsea Manning. However, it was never proved during the Manning uh, trial or since that Nathaniel Frank was Julian Assange. And so Eller was asked if he had been asked to investigate who Nathaniel Frank actually was. And Heller said, no, I wasn't even asked. And he said, did you see any evidence that it was Julian Assange on the other end? And he said, no, I saw, I saw no evidence at all that it was Julian Assange on the other end of the chat. There is no forensic evidence um, or evidence in the actual chat itself uh, that could indicate that this uh, was, was Assange. And so it was asked by Mark Summers, who was the uh, defense lawyer, well, why did you use Assange's name interchangeably in your report with Nathaniel Frank? And suddenly there was this gotcha moment uh, with Eller, and he said, well, it was just assumed that it was him. Um, excuse me. Um, yes, I really shouldn't have assumed that. Um, so that's a big question mark there. It, it makes this whole... Um, the actual identities of the two people, it's, first of all, it's not clear what they're talking about, what it's for, and then it's not clear who's actually speaking on the other end with Manning. It might have been Ziggy. I don't know. Um, I really don't know, but there is no proof that this Nathaniel Frank was Julian Assange on the other end. This is the, uh, what's great about the digital, uh, the fingerprint on your computers, I guess that is forensic evidence um, that uh, can link you to what you do on your computer, especially with regards to passwords and all kinds of installing and, and downloading and sometimes that kind of thing. Um, so what was actually said was that a hash was provided. Um, that is an encrypted password. To try and keep this non-technical, James uh, Lewis did go into the whole process of how it's done. Um, but uh, what was actually said was that a hash was provided by Manning and Nathaniel Frank, which I'm going to use from now on, said that they had rainbow tables to crack this password and uh, to, hash, to crack the hash. What's normally done is a password is encrypted into a hash format. What uh, allegedly was the purpose of, of these rainbow tables, and there is another way, uh, was to reverse engineer that process of encryption from a hash, and it was only a part of a hash, back into uh, a plain text password. 
and and the purpose was allegedly so that Manning could log into a computer uh, under another identity and so that it would be harder to detect uh, who had done this. Now, Eller came through with um, compelling evidence that, in fact, um, first of all, uh, oh, there was a and there was another uh, user account that was identified called, not sure it was just called FTP or FTP user, um, but that was um, that was identified by Megan Brown, FBI agent, as allegedly the user that Manning logged into in order to download these uh, files anonymously. But Eller pointed out that Manning had to be logged into her computer under her own identity in order to get access to the defense information, the information that was on Cipronet, that if she were logged into a computer as FTP user, uh, there would be no access. The other thing that was incredibly important was that anything that happens on those computers, all of the information being stored on what was called the T drive, so that would be the online server, and Manning's on a local machine. So every access that was made to that information on the T drive was actually tracked. And the IP address of the individual computer that was used to access it, that means regardless of what the login was, it was the actual physical address of the computer that was in the logs. And Eller was asked if Manning knew this, and he said, yes, uh, I believe she did. She knew that this would be tracked. Another really significant detail is that all of the um, Reykjavik 13, the uh, Guantanamo files, the Afghan war logs, and the Iraq war logs were all downloaded already before this chat between nobody, <laughs> Manning, and Nathaniel Frank, question mark, took place. And so the only documents that were obtained after the chat log were the cables. Um, the other thing is that under her own identity, logged in as Bradley dot Manning at the time, that was how she could, only way that she could access these documents. And Manning had legal access. Manning had a top secret clearance uh, which it was argued by her lawyers in the trial that after she became um, emotionally distraught uh, over personal issues, um, that perhaps this top secret clearance should have been revoked before she was sent off to Iraq. However, um, Manning did not access any top secret or deliver any top secret information whatsoever to Julian Assange or if it were Julian Assange on that chat. Uh, it was WikiLeaks, really. I think that's the idea that the uh, prosecution wants to bring Julian Assange out of WikiLeaks as as a single defendant in this case, as, as a single person who is culpable for all this, when in fact we know that there were uh, other team members and, and various tasks that uh, people looked after. It's still the case today. Um, so I think I've covered most of it. Did she need a password to get classified information? Absolutely not. I, when she we did were, not. Did she need the password to get the videos and not to get the classified information? Well, there's mixed reports because it seems that a technical officer um, was actually assisting the soldiers in installing these video games on their computers. Uh, that We don't really know. It may have been Manning. Um, but I think the important thing to remember, apart from the, the video games thing, which was, yeah, suggested in the first week of extradition hearings, that that was the purpose of this hash code, was to download uh, films, video games, and um, music videos, uh, because these were not allowed to be installed on soldiers' computers. So I'm not quite sure, I, it wasn't that clear to me, but what was very, very clear was Ellen saying that there was no advantage to gaining anonymity because there was no way that Manning could have accessed the documents anonymously. If the password had been cracked and this other user was logged into, that user didn't have access to the T drive. Um, the T drive is where the classified materials exactly. are stored. 
exactly. That's where all of the classified material was stored. And uh, yeah, and on the computer, whichever user it was, everything was tracked to the IP address and it was easy to work out which soldier was on shift at the time and which one uh, was actually likely to have done it. Although, and this was something that came out at Manning's trial, that there were a number of people who had access to Manning's computer, if memory serves, up to five different people. So I thought but at the time... she did confess at the trial. That yes, Manning confessed, yes. but... Now, what about the Royal CD, the Linux CD? Okay, so that was another reason why the password wouldn't have needed to be cracked, because Manning had a CD with a Linux operating system on it, and the, the computer could have been booted up from the CD, and that would have bypassed the security, uh, the username the security. So... Kromberg described four stages of getting the material off the T drive and then preparing it and then exfiltrating it is the word that was used and then delivering it to WikiLeaks. So this is really the third stage um, of exfiltration and of third and fourth stage. One and two, steps one and two, getting the information could not have been done anonymously ever. And three and four, there was no need to be anonymous because uh, Manning had this CD that would enable the whole security system to be bypassed. So the bottom line is, Julian Assange, first of all, the indictment says that they did not succeed in cracking this password. However, Lewis said to Eller on the stand, how do you know that they didn't succeed? Yes, You 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 don't have the evidence, the government's evidence, but the indictment itself and the extradition request both state that they did not succeed. Yeah. But had they succeeded, it would not have helped Chelsea Manning, who had already delivered to WikiLeaks the Iraq and the Afghan files, yeah, would right. not have helped her get more classified information. Mm. And the indictment only alleges that it was done to help hide her identity yeah. so that investigators could not find out who it was, which is a normal tactic of investigative journalism, which is to hide your source. There's nothing different from that than any what any reporter does, especially in national security reporting, to hide the identity of your source. So that's mm-hmm. all he was trying. That's all they're alleging he was doing in the indictment. Mm-hmm. And yet we've gone through this entire day of testimony on this highly technical and complex matter. And I'm not quite sure what Vanessa Barrett understood out of this or not, and what the point of it really was, what the defense was trying to say, and what the government was trying to say. Well, I think the case is globally very weak. We we had this long discussion about um, how that pass because how that password might have been cracked. Um, Eller said that at the time uh, it would not have been possible uh, to use brute force. That means taking a dictionary and going through every word, you know, you just bombard. I think there wasn't the computing power back then. Um, Lewis pointed to vulnerabilities um, uh, back then uh, with Microsoft software, um, but uh, and he went into a long explanation of how these vulnerabilities could have exploit, been exploited. Eller was looking like he wanted to say something for a long time, and I feel that Julian might have been giggling at the time because after all that, uh, uh, Eller said, but uh, there was a patch in 1999 that uh, that remove this vulnerability so all you know basically everything uh, uh, uh that lewis had said was irrelevant um i think what is really relevant is that they have just about nothing to hang around this actual chat between two people um we don't know what the password uh, was for um, we don't know if it was going to be used within the context, of which kind of computer or, or whether it was government computer or not, they are alleging that it was. And, they, and, and also, I think Eller demonstrated very clearly that, they, that, that cracking this password would be of no use whatsoever to maintaining anonymity or... Um, yeah, uh, at all. Or um, getting classified information. Or getting the classified information that she had access to, uh, but anonymity was not possible because she was on a system where 
the IP address, which is a unique address of your computer, was being recorded uh, for every activity, so no matter the user. So I think that's really important. And I think that you cannot assume that Nathaniel Frank was Julian Assange. I think the government have really pulled the wool over everyone's eyes on that, even uh, Patrick Eller, because he went, I, he apologized and said, yes, I was assuming that. And you were saying, I think everyone thinks it's, it was Julian, but actually there is no proof of it's irrelevant, that either. Though, because he, didn't, he didn't commit a crime. That's what they're saying, that he committed a crime trying to help her to crack the password. And from what I understand, she doesn't need a password to get the classified information exactly. that she's legally access to. And, end of story. And she could have leaked top secret information, but she chose not to. And in fact, one of the things in the chat log, uh, the chat between these two people, uh, Manning says, these files have been sanitized. Now, what does that mean? That means that really damaging information, dangerous information uh, had been removed already, uh, excluded by Manning. And so it is uh, also the what we've seen from the people like John Goetz, for example, who talks about the rigorous reduction process, and we've also heard this outside of the court from Mark Davis, that it was an extremely rigorous, long reduction, meticulous reduction process engaged upon with all of the media partners together in a very professional manner, and that accounts for until the next year when the password got leaked out and we won't go into that but that is given as an explanation of why their rigor in redacting that was why nobody got hurt well thank you very much kathy for um trying to explain what is an unbelievably complex day the really major news again was that vanessa berates cited the u.s election which kristen hafferson said shows this, the political nature of this case. Yeah. She cited that election to give four weeks to the defense to, in fact, prepare their final arguments. So we all need a long weekend here. And fortunately, it is a Friday. And uh, we won't be back in court until Monday morning. That means that's when we'll be back on CN Live to bring you Monday's testimony, the last week of testimony. And then four weeks will ensue after that, for the preparation of final arguments and it won't be until January, most likely, that we will learn whether Beretta has decided to send Assange to the United States or not. If she does, there'll be an appeal without any question by the defense. That could take many, many more months with the high court in Britain. We could ultimately go to the Supreme Court. This won't be resolved. But we heard some really heart-wrenching testimony about Assange's physical and mental condition. And he's continuously stay kept in this prison, Belmarsh. And at one point today, Fitzgerald actually said to her, well, uh, you know, all the, the, these, this issue of Assange, because she raised the idea that Assange will be still in jail uh, throughout this whole period and wanting to argue why it should be sped up. And he said, well, you could have granted her bail. And she did not. So Mr. Assange, please come back on Monday, she said, as if he has a choice. Well, we will be back on Monday. And that's our choice. Thank you for watching this edition of CN Live's recording on Julian Assange's extradition hearing. Until Monday, this is Joe Laurie of CN Live. Goodbye.